Christ. I'm going to invite you, if you will, to open up your Bibles to the book of Isaiah chapter 43. The book of Isaiah chapter 43. As the Lord says, behold, I'm about to do something new. That is something that's not existed before. Uh, I'm about to do something new. In other words, uh, I'm going to do something that I'm forming, that I am creating, that I am making. And the question is, what are some brand new things that the Lord is doing among us at Sarasota Baptist? Well, he is giving us a, a new hope, right? As we think about Easter, Palm Sunday, the resurrection from the dead, uh, all that he has done for us. Uh, but the Lord is also giving us a new schedule because we're growing. Everybody excited about growing? Let's hear that. Yeah, we love to grow. And as we see, this service is mostly full. Our second service is halfway empty uh, or halfway full. Let's be optimistic. And uh, so we're going to be doing some schedule adjustments. So all of the kiddos that are in the room, they're going to be going to 9 o'clock worship and then at 1030, they're going to be coming together. And I'm going to invite every child to be a pastor's pal. So going forward from August, uh, April 16th, uh, I'll be given a mystery word in each one of my sermons. So all of the kids could be pastor's pals. And at the end of several weeks, we're going to be having pool parties and special uh, celebrations over all of our children being engaged in that. And then also our students, just here for our students this morning, I was out with them at Sarasota High School last night for the Fields of Faith event. Several hundred of our students were there, and we're grateful for them. They're going to be in 9 o'clock hour, and then they're going to be coming to the 1030 uh, worship hour. And uh, so we're looking forward to that. And then we've got some new groups that are forming. And if I mention uh, one of these groups and you're a part of it, then give us a shout out this morning. That means raise your hand or say amen or whoo, you know, something like that. Uh, but we've got a 50-somethings group. They just uh, met for a fellowship this past week. That's a new group that's forming. Uh, we've got a C20s. This would be the young uh, C 20-somethings. Uh, we've got the Estudio Biblico uh, that Pastor Hernan leads this group uh, that will be uh, for me. We've got the Faithful Friends. Let's hear it for them. The Learn and Serve. Uh, we've got the Life Builders that are there. We've got the Pathways group. All right. I, I, I knew I would get some. We've got the Tech and Worship group that meets during uh, one of our worship hours for... There we go. That's, I knew you were over there. Uh, we've got the more noble Bereans. Uh, we've got the under construction. Uh, we've got the women's for Christ. And then the women's group. Uh, my, my wife will be leading uh, that new group that will be starting. And then young parents. And then younger parents. All right. There they are. All right, there we go. And uh, they're awake this morning. Okay, good. So we're, we're excited. So we want to think about what, what are some new relationships. God said, I'm about to do something new. What's, what's new? Listen to this. Uh, being fresh spiritually does not happen in isolation. If you want renewal, it always happens in relationships. And so if you're in a connect group, let me see your hand. Okay. That's about two out of three of us that are here and so some of you are saying well pastor I, I i love worship i love being here in worship can i encourage you uh, just to find someone to raise their hand or if you're in a connect group maybe you're going to a nine o'clock hour and you're going to be worshiping at 10 30. look around you and find people like you and welcome them uh, to be a part of journeying life together it's going to be exciting and then uh, something new's happening today. We're going to have Easter spring fling. Are you excited? Uh, you say, uh, the question is, are you hungry? We've got food trucks coming to campus, and this is for all generations. Can I get a witness? Uh, not just for our kiddos. So we want you to come, whether you got kids or not. We want you to come, and we want you to in, in, uh, have some conversations. Meet new people. Say, I don't, I don't recognize that person. Introduce yourself. How long have you been in Sarasota? You know, what do you like most about the church? Just talk, create conversations. That's how uh, we engage with one another. You say, well, pastor, you've been speaking about being made brand new. How does that even start? 
It starts by forgiveness. I'm going to invite you with your Bibles open, your hearts open, Isaiah chapter 43. I'm going to invite you, if you will, to stand with me as we honor the reading of the God-breathed text, the Word of the Lord. You'll notice this text of Scripture up on the iMag. I'm going to invite you, if you will, church family, let's read aloud the Word of God together. Do not remember the past events. Pay no attention to the things of old. Look, I'm about to do something new. Even now it is coming. Do you not see it? Indeed, I will make a way in the wilderness, rivers in the desert. Wild animals, jackals, and ostriches will honor me because I provide water in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to my chosen people. The people I form for myself will declare my praise. But Jacob, you have not called on me, because Israel, you have become weary of me. You have not brought me your sheep for burnt offerings, or honored me with your sacrifices. I have not burdened you with offerings or wearied you with incense. You have not brought me aromic cane with silver or satisfied me with fat of your sacrifices, but you have burdened me with your sins. You have wearied me with your iniquities. I am the one. I sweep away your transgressions for my own sake and remember your sins no more. Remind me, let's argue the case together. Recount the facts so that you may be vindicated. Your first father sinned and your mediators have rebelled against me. So I defile the officers of the sanctuary and set Jacob apart for destruction and Israel for scorn. Father, we pray the blessing of your spirit upon the reading of the word of God. And we pray now, Lord, that you administer deeply to our hearts, even as we have been singing and lifting our voices and hearts. Now, God, we pray that your word would wash over our hearts for we pray in jesus name and all of god's people said amen, amen. you may be seated thank you so much for standing god desires for us to experience some brand new things in worship uh, sadly we too often fall into ruts doing what is expected what we have always done we drift toward enshrining the past so that we would evade the future. But God desires, in verse 21, you'll notice, he desires for us, he says, the people that I form for myself will declare my praise. That is, that we will lift our voices and that we will speak of his majesty, his excellence, his beauty, his wonder. There is a sense of gratitude and thanksgiving and adoration that God has formed us for. And yet, why is it so seldom that we fall into ruts like the people of Israel in the Old Covenant? It is because of prayerlessness. Notice verse 22. He says, you're not calling on me. You don't worship God unless you pray. Notice in verse 22 that people were not worshiping because of passivity. They said, uh, we have become <laughs> weary uh, of you. Verse 23, they were not bringing their best. They were not bringing their offerings or their incenses. In verse 24, we find another reason why they were not worshiping is, was because of paralysis. He said, you have burdened me with your sins. You have wearied me because of your iniquities. Spiritually, they were paralyzed. We would call this an impasse of relationship. They were not 
hearing from God. They were not experiencing God. They were at this place of unrepentant sin and, and complacency. Verses 27 and 28 that we just read, God is holding their leaders accountable. Your first father, your mediators, the officers of the sanctuary. Notice here, I love in verse number 20, God highlights animals that do a better job of worshiping him than what the redeemed people of God do. Notice in verse 20, he says, wild animals, jackals, and ostriches uh, will honor me. You say, how do they honor me? Notice this picture. I, I drew this for you uh, up uh, this week. There you go. There we go. Huh? That's right. Ostriches, they, they honor me. Does anybody look like that this morning? Right? Okay. Uh, they, they honor me. They're magnifying me, but he's saying that my, my people are not doing that. So let me ask you a question. How's your heart? Are you worshiping the Lord? Are you having a sense of joy in your presence? There might be adversity, but is there joy in your heart? Is there a sense of gratitude? Are you deepening your relationship with the Lord? Not just honoring God with a few words of our mouth, but is, is your heart close unto Him? Could it be that right now we just need to pause before the Lord and make a confession to Him? Confession would be something like you uh, see up on the screen uh, when we turn to the Lord and we say to him, Lord, you made me to declare your praise. And I confess, what, what is it that's been keeping me from worshiping you? Cleanse me and create a new heart for me. So would it be a confession, Lord, my, my schedule's been too busy? Do we have any busy saints this morning? Lord, I've just been too busy to have my daily time with you. Or, or Lord, I, I misplaced my priorities. Or, God, I, I have been reverting to my fleshly desires or or god i've been thinking wrongly could we just right now just come and reason with the lord isaiah 118 and though our hearts might be defiled by our own uh, priorities our own sin could we ask the lord right now could we just pray in our heart lord cleanse me would you pray that with me cleanse me or give me a right spirit create in me a a new heart a church family, when, when we humbly confess our sin before God, what does God do with our sin? Now, this is an interactive sermon. You can talk back to your pastor today. When we confess our sin before God, church family, what does God do with our sin? He forgives us, and he forgets our sin. Notice the text, Isaiah 43, verse 25, I am the one. I sweep away your transgressions for my own sake, and I remember your sins no more. God says, remind me. Just, just, let, let's argue this case together. Let's, let's recount the facts so that you can be vindicated. A couple of words I'm going to draw out of that text. The word sweep away means to obliterate. God says, I will I will wipe away, I will uh, efface, I will erase uh, your sins. I will remember your sins no more. What does that mean? That means uh, that you're cleared of all charges. Uh, it means that God will never speak of your sins publicly. It means that God will never shame you. God will never condescend toward you. I will remember your sins no more. And so that you may be vindicated. Let's, let's, God says, let's have a conversation. Uh, church, family, uh, this is not a dialogue today between you and me. This is a trialogue. God says, I, I, I want to talk with you about this. So that you could be vindicated. That means you're cleared of all charges. That's what the New Testament talks about being justified by our faith in Jesus Christ. Let's reckon on this truth. Let's think about this. Now you say, now pastor, how is this forgiveness even possible? It, it's not by just any sacrifice. It's by the sacrifice of the Lamb of God. John chapter 1 verse 29, John's disciples saw Jesus walking by and John says, look, there's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. 
Hebrews chapter 2 or chapter 9 verse number 14 says it is through the blood of Christ who is offered by the eternal spirit unto God who is able to cleanse our consciences from dead works that we might serve the living God first John chapter 1 verse number 7 says that as we walk in the light as he is in the light we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all of our sin so church family if this is true if an all-knowing God says I don't know your sin anymore think about that an omniscient God says I remember your sin no more if that is so true and so miraculous which I believe it is then why is it that we still feel guilty at times? Why do we struggle as God's people with condemnation and at times feel unclean? It is because many times we do not discern the difference between, notice this church, condemnation and conviction. What's the difference? Let me tell you a story that sort of illustrates that. Uh, there's a a lieutenant during the World War II, Lieutenant General Jonathan Mayhew Wainwright, that on May 6, 1942, he fell into uh, enemy's hands in the Philippine campaign, and for uh, three years he was a prisoner of war. It's uh, indescribable, the sufferings that, uh, that General Wainwright endured, uh, the cruelties, the malnutrition, the physical, the verbal abuse you see his picture up on the Time magazine there, the psychological mind games. But the war had ended, and yet he was still held captive. His, his prisoners, those that held him captive, didn't tell him that his enemy, that, they, that his commander-in-chief had overcome their commander-in-chief. So they kept him prisoner until an allied air force flew in uh, to that concentration camp, and he stood at the barbed wire fence and announced to the prisoners on the other side our commander-in-chief has overcome general wainwright made himself uh, picked himself out up he walked up to the commanding soldiers uh, office and he said my commander-in-chief has defeated your commander-in-chief i've come to take over and uh the general laid down his sword and uh, as we could see, he was a decorated war veteran for that. But think about this. For three years, he was a free man, but he was living in prison. That is so much like so many believers, sadly, that have been forgiven. Oh, you say, well, you know, that's a sweet by and by. We're going to be with the Lord forever. But right about, what about the right here and now? Jesus doesn't just free us from our guilt and our sin just for the sweet by and by. He wants us right here, right now, to experience our sins being swept away and him remembering our iniquity no more. You see, to condemn means to judge someone or, uh, as unfit or deficient. Uh, condemnation produces a sentence of punishment. When we're condemned, there's a sense of worthlessness, and that is not from God because the Bible says, Romans chapter 8, verse number 1, therefore there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Condemnation might cause us to have the following thoughts. I, I can't do anything right. I, I'm not as good as other people. I'm a terrible person. Condemnation sounds like this, that I'm not as important as others. It's all my fault. I'm not worthy to receive other people's love. But in contrast, God says that you're more valuable than everything in this world. In God's eyes, he said, I've loved you and valued you so much that I gave you my son. I've accepted you and your sins and your failures have been removed and you are a person of great price. So what's the difference? You'll notice in your listening notes, I've got a, a chart uh, drawn out for you. So I'm going to invite you, if you will, to, to fill in this chart. And let's go, 
let's discern today. Let's allow the ministry of the word to really set us free today. And let's discern what's the difference between condemnation and conviction. First of all, the, let's look at the source of this, the source of condemnation and conviction. There are different sources. Condemnation, and as you're filling in the chart, comes from Satan, others, and from ourselves. But conviction has a different source. Conviction comes from who? The Holy Spirit. So just go ahead and fill in the blank there. Condemnation is wrongly sourced. Uh, as Revelation chapter 12, verse number 10 says, the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before God both day and night has been thrown down. Now, church family, who is the accuser of the brethren who accuses us before God both day and night? Who is that? Who might that be? Satan. Satan. That's right. And the good news is he's been thrown down. He's been uh, defeated. Satan, the accuser of the brethren, often condemns us. He says, you've sinned again, the same sin that you confessed yesterday. Uh, Satan will say, uh, you've often had a problem in this area, and there's something really wrong with you. Just admit it, you're a failure. Then this source, not only from Satan, but from other people. Other people can also experience condemnation and then tell hurtful lies such as you'll never amount to anything a lie that you can never do anything right or uh, th that's okay uh, but maybe you could do better the next time others can maybe sometimes not even realize that they're heaping condemnation and then we have this thing called self-talk we we talk to ourselves yeah you talk to yourself i talk to myself and sometimes we, we have uh, self-talk. Just imagine that you've got a lunch appointment. And the uh, person, as you're uh, making your way into the restaurant, texts you and says, uh, sorry, something came up today. I can't meet you for lunch. How, how do you process that in, in your mind? Maybe uh, you would say, well, he just didn't want to take time to be with me. I'm not that important. I'm not just important to him or her. I, I'm not important at all. We could, we could have this self-talk that brings condemnation. Remember, the source of condemnation is Satan, others, and ourself. But what is the source of conviction? The source of conviction is what Jesus said in John chapter 16, verse number 8. He says, when he, the Holy Spirit, comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and of righteousness and of judgment. You see, the Holy Spirit is the one who convicts us of our sin. And I want to remind you of what Jesus said in John chapter 3, verse number 17. He said, for the Son of Man did not come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be what, church? Saved. He didn't come to condemn, but he came to save. So, first of all, let's notice the, the scope of condemnation, conviction, where it comes from. But let's second of all, jot this one down in, in your graph there. Condemnation and conviction have different scopes. They have different scopes. When condemnation comes toward you, it is very general. Write that down, general, underneath condemnation in that column. It's general. But when conviction, when the Holy Spirit convicts us, it is very specific. Very specific. So condemnation is general, and it has such a, an elusive attack, such as, you're a worthless person. That's pretty general. Qu question, how are you supposed to deal with that? <laughs> what do you do with, I'm worthless. Or, or you're, a, you're a terrible Christian. Or, or, or you're wor worthless. How, how are you even supposed to deal with that? But conviction is very specific. The Holy Spirit says, when you were having that conversation over lunch, that story you told was a lie. Very specific. He points that out. Not... Not to condemn us, but so that we might be confessed. That what do we do when we're convicted of our sin? We confess that to God. God, what I said to my friend at lunch was a lie. I confess that. I ask you to forgive me. God always does that in our life by his Holy Spirit. So conviction, condemnation, are you with me this morning? 
has different sources, different scopes, but jot this down further in your chart. Condemnation and conviction have different focal points. Different focal points. Condemnation, the focal point of condemnation attacks our identity and our self-worth. Conviction addresses specific actions. You see, condemnation attempts to tear down our worthless. You, you're worthless. You, you're terrible. You'll never amount to anything. You'll never change. Condemnation focuses our attention on our failures and uses our sin to taint our concept of who we are. I sin, therefore I'm a terrible person, and God is, I'm not worthy of God's love. It makes the consequences seem permanent, condemnation does. You sin, God can never forgive you. And particularly in regards to sins that we continually commit, uh, you've done it again. God's tired of hearing you confess your sin. You're just going to have to live with all these consequences. But what does conviction do? Conviction, by contrast, address specific actions, things that we did or that we failed to do. You're insensitive to your spouse. That's conviction of the Holy Spirit. I get that at times. Because Liliana says, you're not listening to me. <laughs> Sometimes the Holy Spirit speaks to me in Spanish. <laughs> or the Holy Spirit will say that you neglected your son, your daughter. And through the provision that God makes through Jesus... God separates who we are from what we do. Who we are from what we do. You see, God says to the believer, I love you, I accept you, regardless of what you do or fail to do. I, I can love you and judge your sin at the same time. My feelings concerning your sin will not affect my love for you you say pastor where do you find that in the bible romans chapter 5 verse number 8 but god demonstrated his own love toward us and that while we were yet what church sinners christ did what died for us this is the word of god are you seeing the difference between condemnation and conviction they have different sources they have different scopes they have different focal points but jot this one down in your in your graph there condemnation and conviction have different futures they have different futures their future outcomes what what's the outcome of con, of con, condemnation it steals our hope there is no hope there is no tomorrow there that we're we're beyond repair but what does the conviction of the Holy Spirit do? The conviction of the Holy Spirit produces hope within inside of us. Condemnation produces hopelessness, despair, discouragement, despondency, gloom. If I'm a worthless person, that means that there is no hope. But by the conviction, it produces feelings of godly sorrow. But when we're convicted and we have godly sorrow, what does that do? It brings about repentance. And when we repent, we confess our sin to Lord God, then we have salvation, and that salvation produces life inside of us. You see, the knowing that God loves me regardless of my sin gives me confidence that the essence of our relationship will not be affected by what I do. You see, when you think about Good Friday, you say, Pastor, that was a horrible day. Why do you call it good? Because of what it accomplished for us through Jesus. Oh, oh, the, the wonder of what Jesus Christ has done for us. And when we turn to him, there is hope. There is a future. There is a, a new, we become brand new. We, we become new creations. There is a transformation that happens inside of our life. I want you to jot this last statement down inside of your graph, and that is condemnation, conviction, have different responses. Responses. You say, well, when, when I'm wrongly condemned, how do I respond? When, when I'm rightly convicted of the Holy Spirit, how do I respond? Well, when we're feeling condemned, we should reject the lies 
and embrace the truth. When we're wrongly condemned, we're rejecting whatever lies the accuser of the brethren or our own selves or others are putting on us. And what do we do? We embrace the truth of the Word of God. But when we're convicted, we confess. You see, condemnation is always based on lies. It's to be rejected. We're to identify the lies, we're to reject the lies, and we're to gratefully receive the truth. You see, condemnation begins with and is sustained by lies that need to be countered and exposed through the Word of God. What about the lie, uh, I'll never amount to anything? What, what, What Bible verse might we counter that with? Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the thoughts I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of good, uh, so that you might have a hope and a future. Uh, what do you do with a, the thought of, I'm just weird, I'm just weird? Uh, well, is, there, is there a Bible verse that counters that? Psalm 129, or 139, I'm fearfully and I'm wonderfully made. I'm knit together in my mother's womb all my days are written in a book before one of them uh, began. What about the lie that, that I'm not important? I'm just not important to anyone. Is there a Bible verse that you could find? What about 1 Corinthians chapter 12 where it says that the hand can't say to the foot, I don't need you. Every member of the body, God has placed everyone together and we're all uh, essential. There may be the lie that I, I'm not worth receiving your love. It, what, what is the truth that we can look to? I love Ephesians chapter 3, verses 17 through 19, that you might know the love of Christ, the height and the depth and the length and the breadth of God's love that surpasses all knowledge. Listen to me this morning. You are infinitely loved. You are valued. You are the apple of God's eye. You are inscribed on his hands. He wears you upon his heart, and you are the redeemed child of the living. God and you say now when I'm condemned what I do reject it and cling to your Bible look in your Bible cling to what who you are in Jesus Christ but now when you're convicted what do you do you confess anytime you do something and the Holy Spirit convicts you of a wrong thought, a wrong word, a wrong action, what, what do you do? There's a godly sorrow that wells up inside of you. That's a good thing. There is such thing as good grief. Charlie Brown coined that phrase, but there is such thing as good grief, godly sorrow. And then we confess to all the offended parties. There's a sermon coming to you near uh, sometime soon called, When You Mess Up, You Fess Up. You first of all, fess to God. God, I I blew it. What you said about my sin is sin. And then to the person that we offended, James 5, 16, we confess our faults one to another. We pray for one another so that we can be healed. And then what happens when we do that? What what does God do with our sin when we confess it? That's right. It's gone. (laughs) Gone. He remembers it no more. Now look at that chart. We, We did a pretty good job of filling in all the the places maybe you wrote some Bible verses there in your notes I hope that you'll meditate on it uh, because this teaching that I'm sharing with you has changed me to be who I am today I lived with a lie for so many years that you can't do anything right Michael even as a pastor I would go into leadership meetings hearing this lie of the devil you can do nothing right but then God has set me free and God wants to do the same thing for you he wants to do the same thing for each one of us and what I want to challenge you to do I know many of you are going to uh, your connect group so I I want you to think about a time that maybe you have experienced some wrong condemnation you were condemned wrongly maybe it was this week just identify what that may be maybe in your workplace maybe it's your school Uh, maybe uh, in a, another context, maybe you felt condescend even by the newscast that was going on in some way. Identify that. And then second of all, can, can you identify a time recently where you experienced the conviction of the Holy Spirit? 
Is there anybody here today that could say, oh me, I've been convicted of the Holy Spirit? I can. And, uh, and so talk about that. Let's talk about uh, what the Word is doing and how He's working in our life. I want you to imagine this. You'll notice it up on the iMag screen. I'm going to lead you into a moment of encountering Jesus. But uh, notice these Bible texts. This is in the uh, idea of a courtroom. He asked, who, who can bring an accusation against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Read this with me, church. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is the one who died and even more has been raised. He is at the right hand of God and intercedes for us. I want to invite you, if you will, just to bow in prayer. And I want you to picture yourself in a courtroom this morning. For many of us, as we would picture a courtroom, it, it would be a place that maybe some anxious feelings come up. A sense that we don't belong here. But as you walk into this courtroom, there are some faces that are familiar to you. Maybe some acquaintances that you would see that have criticized and judged you. As you walk in, you would see people that have rejected or neglected or abused you. These faces are those who, whose love and acceptance has always been contingent on your performance. Now maybe your anxiety has turned to fear and self-doubt and condemnation. You're all alone in this courtroom with a group of adversaries. But now I want you to imagine and picture one entering this courtroom whose name is love. Jesus Christ enters in. And he doesn't take the place at the courtroom bench even though he has every right to take that position. But instead, he walks right up beside you. He puts his arms around you and then gently bows where you're on your knees. Kneeling beside you, this one who has the right to bring every charge against you. You're, you hear him praying. And he's not accusing you, but he is praying for you. He's praying for the burdens on your heart. He's requesting provision for your life. He is speaking blessings over you. And most importantly, he's asking that you would receive freedom from condemnation. As you're in this moment, you'll sense that the courtroom has become empty. All those who we're going to accuse you are no longer around. And Jesus asks you, where are your accusers? Those who have criticized, those who have judged, those who have rejected, neglected you. You may sense right now your anxiety turning to joy. Your fear being replaced by peace. I want you to meditate quietly upon these wonders of God's truth. Would you just now offer to God a prayer of thanksgiving, maybe a prayer of praise, a prayer of worship. If you're with a spouse or a family member, maybe you want to pray together. Just take a moment just to pray words of adoration and praise. Heavenly Father, we are in all of your forgiveness. God, thank you that you are the one who sweeps away our sins. 
and that you remember them no more. As we confess before you and we trust in your son Jesus, we thank you that you cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness and that you make us perfectly whole in your presence. Lord, we worship you. We adore you. God, we, we feel like the, the people on the side of that pathway of your triumphal entry. God, we have joyful hearts of praise. And we honor you this day. And we do so in Jesus' wonderful name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Now, if you're here today and you say, Pastor, I sense today that uh, God is speaking to me that I need to be saved. I need to give my heart and my life to Jesus Christ. Let me encourage you not to leave here the way that you came in. Let me encourage you to leave here today forgiven and free. Just a moment, all around the auditorium, there's going to be people with these badges on. If you've got one of these badges, lift them up for me. Or if you're, you have one of these badges, lift them up, okay? They'll have a next step. And if you're here today and you say, you know, I'd like to know about what it means to take the next step to follow Jesus, uh, to give my life to him, we would encourage you to do that today and make that commitment. I I'm going to have mine on. I'll be standing right up here. But also, you'll notice people al along the side of the building, also in the foyer and out in the plaza area, they're going to have one of these. And if you feel comfortable, go and talk to one of them, one of us, and say, hey, I I like to know what it means to be saved. I like to commit my life to Jesus Christ. We'll be very happy to journey with you, to support you. We're friends, and we want to do that. We'll make it really easy for you to access. There are others of you that are here today. You say, you know, uh, Pastor, I've accepted Christ, and, and boy, I'm forgiven. I'm so glad I'm forgiven. But you, you've not yet taken that next step, that next step to follow Jesus in believer's baptism. Uh, stop by one of the next step persons and let us know, hey, I'd like to take that next step of following Jesus in believer's baptism. Others of you would say, hey, I, I, I'm new here at Sarasota Baptist Church. W what do I need to do to become a member? And uh, they could tell you about our beginning steps class that's coming up just a week after next. And we would love for you to be a part of that and uh, we can get you signed up for it. So just come by uh, the next steps. Now, you'll notice in your listening guide uh, that we've got some Beyond Sunday challenges. So I'm going to challenge you uh, to go beyond just hearing the word. I've uh, given you a couple of discussion things that you could talk with a friend or group about. I want to challenge you to memorize. Isn't this great? Isaiah uh, 43, verse 25. I'm the one that will sweep away your transgressions for my own sake, and I'll remember your sins no more. So go ahead and memorize that, and every once in a while, let out a shout, okay? If you're memorizing this verse, this, this uh, give a shout uh, to God because of his goodness. And then let me encourage you to invite someone. We want to we want to believe God that next week we're going to put out extra chairs, make extra room. Uh, but we want to believe that both of our worship gatherings are going to be filled to overflowing. And we want you to bring family members, friends, uh, co-workers, those that go to school with you. Invite people to come to Good Friday, two of services, 6 and 7.15. It'll be about 50 minute uh, in duration, each one of those. We want to invite you to be a part of that. And then Resurrection Day. And then if you're not reading the Bible with us daily, if you'll go to our website or to our SBC app, uh, you could find the Bible reading guide. I've written a daily devotion that goes along with the Bible series that I'm preaching on, Isaiah. And so we want to encourage you to do that. Would you stand with me this morning? Had it been a good day in the house of the Lord? Yes. Amen. Amen. Father in heaven, we're so thankful that you have given your only son for us. And as we consider, consider your great grace, we praise you, Lord, that you allow us to have the grace to give. We pray, Lord, that we would be those that would freely give what you've given to us so that this local ministry and also that the missions of this church might be furthered to the ends of the earth. Father, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for a beautiful day that you've given us for our Easter spring fling on this Palm Sunday. We pray it would be a very special day for each one that's here. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen.
God bless you.